Hi, everyone. I am so excited to uh, give you guys a little bit information about CBD, about the history of cannabis. Um, just a lot of good information. And so we'll wait for some people to get on saying that I can't comment. I wonder if I'll be able to see any chat messages. Let's see. I will jump on and see if I can see this from the other side. Okay, I can, I can hopefully see <laughs> the chats here. Okay, hi everyone, happy lunch and learn. Usually I do lunch and learns on Friday, but I'm gonna start doing a lot more education, a lot more lives. Um, you guys let me know what you wanna learn um, because I've been doing this for a really long time. I've studied this plant for years and years and years and years. I've been certified through several organizations and um, I'm here to help you, uh, educate you on CBD, educate you on cannabis, educate you on the laws, educate you on best practices and usage. If you are a practitioner, please um, feel free to get with me and see how you can bridge the gap um, between your work and the emerging cannabis market. Um, and, uh, and, and I would love so much to um, help you on your journey. So uh, my name is Marlies. If you didn't already know that, hi, welcome to my page. <laughs> I am a certified medical cannabis advisor. I have been doing this professionally for five years and I own a consultancy called Indie Hemp, uh, Indie Hemp Co. And I do uh, mainly education and consulting work uh, for private consultations. And then I do also work with medical practitioners and we refer back and forth, whether it's for uh, physical ailments, mental ailments, uh, inflammation control, you name it, um, we've been working with it. And um, I realized talking with a bunch of people recently that there's still a lot of misunderstanding with CBD, a lot of questions about the history, the efficacy, how it works in the body, um, so many questions. So I'm gonna go over all of that with you today. So to start off, I want to talk to you guys about the history of cannabis. The history of cannabis goes back actually 10,000 years. We have documented carbon footprint um, of the ropes and different industrial products that have been used uh, using the variety that you would know as hemp. Um, cannabis is a species that includes uh, many varieties and many strains, uh, and they can look like you see in this picture, very tall and stocky, and that's more of the industrial use of hemp, uh, where the flowering tops are at the very top of the, of the, um, the plant, and then you can also see it more as bushy, and the bushier plants are usually cultivated for the medicine. Um, but let's look at the actual documented history of cannabis in medical terms. So in 2900, around that time, BC, uh, credited with bringing civilization to China, the emperor actually made reference to ma, which is the Chinese word for cannabis, noting that it was a very popular medicine. And it has been documented several times in the Chinese pharmacopoeia that it had been used more widely than any other medicine at that time. And so thinking back 5,000 years ago, that gives us a good ind indicator that for about probably thousands of years before that um, cannabis was being used as a medicine. Uh, and then jumping forward, you now if you, you can look throughout history, there is so much um, where it has been used in every single civilization across the world. And now um, in America, you know, there's a lot of people saying there's no history of cannabis use in America, but actually it was part of the United States pharmacopoeia and was added in 1850. And, in, and, and after that, actually pharmacies and pharmaceutical companies were using cannabis as a medicine. It was the primary medicine for over a hundred ailments and diseases. But then moving forward with the prohibition, it was removed back off of it. And that was kind of the introduction to, um, 
to the compounding pharmacy. So we, we had the introduction of aspirin and, and specific doses. And so it was difficult for pharmacies to give specific doses to clients um, or their patients. And then it was pulled back off of the US uh, pharmacopeia, but there's more reason to that um, in the next slide. So when we look at the history of hemp in America, um, going back to our original forefathers, um, Thomas Jefferson here has a great quote, hemp is of the first necessity to wealth and protection of our country. Um, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were both cannabis farmers. And in George Washington's diary, he indicated that he grew hemp at Mount Vernon, his plantation for over 30 years. And according to his agricultural ledgers, he had particular interest in the medicinal use of cannabis and had several of his entries indicating that he was growing cannabis with both high THC contents as well as hemp for industrial uses in paper. And while he didn't specifically say THC because we didn't know that was the molecule, when you think of the pain relief and the associated feelings with cannabis, it is a very good indicator that this was on the higher THC level. Um, now going back to um, the 19 or the 1850s, um, Claire Aubrey Huston was born in Philly in 1857 and did the front side of the 1944 $10 denomination. And if you can see here on the, the $10 bill, on the left side, that is a hemp farming operation. So you see the horses and you see the hemp being shucked from the ground and placed on top of the um, trailer, or uh, I don't know what it would be called, but, and then on the right side, you see big industry beginning. And so this was the 1944 $10 denomination and the Secretary of Treasury, Andrew Mellon, who signed at the bottom right was the head of Standard Oil, which now today is ExxonMobil and one, and one of the largest oil companies um, in the world. And he was also the secretary to five US presidents. Why is that important to us? Because hemp farming was the primary, primary industrial product of our of our human existence. It was used for paper and it was used for um, food and medicine and um, clothing and rope and all of the the building products at that time was used with hemp uh, primarily and we had big business coming in and so standard oil uh, was taking a lot of the petroleum um, byproducts and utilizing them into new products. We also had the cotton industry that was very strong and the lumber industry that was very strong and so if we look at the cotton lumber um, media industries and the petroleum industries, they were um, threatened by hemp, honestly, uh, because of the ability for hemp to grow. Like this is why we call they call it weed because it grows like a weed. It grows very, very fast. It can grow in all climates, all, almost every soil composition. It doesn't need a lot of water. It doesn't need a lot of processing. It doesn't need bleaching agents or chemicals or herbicides or any of these things. So you would think, right, that's great. It's a very cheap product. You could make lots of money. Well, cotton and lumber, they take actually a lot of processing. So you're, you know, water for cotton, cotton actually takes more water than any crop. Um, same with trees, you know, trees take so long to um, grow. And then when you cut them down, you have to process the pulp, you have to bleach the pulp, all of these things. And so there were more opportunities for big business to make money because the cotton and the lumber industry and several other industries had the opportunity to make more money with herbicides and water treatment and bleaching agents and all of this. So does that make sense? Hemp was going to, um, you know, possibly put them out of business. And so there was a lot of funding. If you go back and look at the money of what was, how reefer madness was paid for in the 1930s and the 1940s, like why did that prohibition start because of hemp, uh, going against these big emerging businesses. And so when you look at who paid for these um, uh, prohibition style campaigns, it was the underlining, you know, big business, Hearst Media, the Rockefellers, um, you know, Standard Oil, and some of these companies didn't want hemp to continue. Uh, and so if you follow the money, it really always tells the story. Um, and then what's more interesting than that is, um, Andrew Mellon, who was head of Standard Oil, his nephew was Henry Ansingler. And Henry Ansingler, who we call the father of cannabis and hemp prohibition, 
became the head of Bureau of Federal Narcotics, which is now known as the DEA, um, which started in 1931. And in 1937, they created the, uh, the Marijuana Tax Act, which would create a taxing program for hemp farmers and cannabis farmers. And then it continued into the 1950s, where we had um, additional uh, marijuana scares. There was a lot of um, issues with the black and Mexican population being the primary users of recreational cannabis. And because there was so much racism in America, they wanted to continue the segregation. So they created campaigns to scare people to say marijuana will make you feel this and this and it'll make you do bad things. It'll make you murder your family. There was actually a whole story propagated that said this guy smoked weed and killed his family. And when you actually look into it, he had a history of mental health issues. He was using lots of other substances, but they've used that story time and time again, um, which is completely untrue. And then moving forward in the 1960s, we saw the, the hippie craze, right? Going against the um, Vietnam War and, and really pushing for peace and harmony. And they were a primary users of cannabis at the time. And at, and, and at that time also, uh, President Nixon had a uh, research study in front of him to show that cannabis did not need to be prohibited as a drug. So that was kind of the campaign that was going on during the Vietnam War and, and that um, movement in the 60s. And even though the research overwhelmingly said cannabis is not dangerous, it is not addictive, it has thousands of medical applications, right? You cannot overdose. It does not turn off the primary functions, the autonomic system of the body. You can't die. Like you cannot overdose from cannabis alone. And even though this, this research was so overwhelming that cannabis was safe, um, he decided to schedule it as a, as a schedule one drug, which means it has no ap medical application. It is highly addictive and dangerous, which we know now is untrue. It is just completely untrue. And so that was really the walk of the prohibition in America, even though going back, we have been using it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. In fact, cannabis is the most researched medicine in human history of all plant medicines and even pharmaceutical medicine. So when we look at what you know, people always say, there's not enough research on cannabis. There's actually over 20,000 public studies that you can have access to on top of research papers. And um, the FDA has clinical studies going on and lots of pharmaceutical companies have patents with cannabis. And this just tells a different story than what we've been told for you know almost a hundred years. So I really, really encourage you to buy some books and learn about the medical applications of cannabis really dive into the history i have a, a ton of videos that i can send you and learn about the truth of where cannabis came from a hundred years ago to now and and that and that story that has been propagated and been told to us for a really long time and i encourage you guys to look past that and remember when you hear about people that have had drug addiction a lot of that starts at a very young age and what drugs drug use in a teenage years does to the human brain is it doesn't allow for coping mechanisms and so children do not they use it as an escape and then in their 20s and 30s if they can't get access to that drug they move on to other drugs it's not that it's a gateway it's just that marijuana is very accessible and so any any drug that creates an opportunity for feeling an escape will uh, can in some people create an addiction but it's less than 10 percent and mostly in teenagers. So I really encourage you to speak with your teens about cannabis use and about the efficacy and safety of it. Now they can use CBD products, but when we get into the properties of feeling high, that can feel like an escape and it could it could really hurt their ability, their, their um, brain development to have proper coping mechanisms. So I just wanted to say that um, because I have to talk to my own child being in the cannabis industry and talking about it every single day and working with medical marijuana uh, practitioners across the country is my daughter, it's very clear to her that this is a drug to be respected. This is a medicine to be respected. And we should look to our indigenous uh, peoples that have been using this for thousands of years on how they have respected this plant. Um, and, and it gives us a good indication of with respect will always come healing. Okay, let's move on to our next slide. 
and learn a little bit about the, his, the uses of hemp. Um, as you can see here, we have realized that hemp has over 50,000 uses. So let's break it down to the different parts of the plant. Let's start with the roots. The roots are fantastic for organic compost. They are fantastic for different medicines and emollients. Then we look to the stalk, and this is where we have the fibrous stalk and the herd inside of the hemp plant that you can use for fiber, for paper, for textiles, for insulation of homes. Fun fact, there are homes that have been built from hemp where the outside structure, the insulation, the inside walls, everything is made from hemp. Hemp actually cleans naturally the air so you don't need a filtration system in your home and it regulates temperature. So there are homes that are built primarily of hemp that really don't need a central AC um, system. And there are buildings that have been made from hemp concrete that are still there today after hundreds and hundreds of years. So it is stronger and, and more uh, sturdy than concrete. It is stronger than steel, but more lightweight than steel. And so these fibers are so, so important to the, the future of our, our, of our big industries. On top of that, animal bedding, fiberboard, rope. Um, if we look back to the Nordic times, um, they were famous for their very strong rope and that was made from hemp at the time. Now let's look at the seeds. Um, the seeds can be used for oil, for seed cake, for hemp nuts, um, milk and dairy products, flour, cooking and seasoning oil. So it's a very, very good food with your three, six and nine omegas. It is considered a very, very, very nutritious product. So if you're not using hemp seeds or hemp oil already in your skincare and in your food, I highly suggest it. Um, obviously as a dietary supplement, hemp seed is a fantastic um, supplement to, to take for your skin, for your hair, Hair, for your nails. Um, it just really helps. Uh, you can make hemp beer uh, just like uh, hops. Hops is a flowering uh, plant. It is very similar to um, the hemp plant. And so you can actually make beer from it. Um, obviously, baking, body care products, animal feed. This was a primary source of nutrition for agriculture and animals for a very long time. Uh, fuel can be made um, biofuel as well as protein powder and paint. And then we look at the leaves and the flowers. So a lot of people see the leaf, right? Our, our little friend, the leaf, that that is what you smoke or use, right? And it's actually false. So the only part of the plant that is utilized as medicine. So when we think about CBD and THC and CBG and some of the other cannabinoids, those are in the flower and the other parts of the plant, like the, the fan leaves and the sugar leaves and the, and the famous part of the plant is actually not utilized um, for the medicine. So let's look at that. Um, the leaves and flowers can be used for animal bedding, mulch and compost, but only the flower part of the female plant, and, and it's only in the female plant that creates flower, um, will be your uh, place for CBD and THC. Now, if you look here on the right, this is really incredible. I want you, I want to talk to you guys about the environment. Let's see right here. This are, these are plastic hemp bottles and they are produced, um, with, just resilient abilities for shelf stability, um, just the same as regular petroleum plastics. But the difference is, is in a compost, they are biodegradable within 80 days, if not, you know, 80 to 90 days, fully compostable. So this is all hemp plastic and it's only in a compost. So you do need um, organic matter. So if you, it's not going to decompose on your shelf. It's not going to decompose if it's next to food. But if you were in an organic compost, the hemp plastic will actually break down and fully go back into the soil. This is something that I think you guys really need to focus on. When we look at the federal legalization of cannabis, it is not so much just for the med medicinal uses and the recreational uses, but it's also for the industry of hemp. Because if we were able to make hemp plastic, let's say that Keurig and um, our friends at Starbucks decided to replace all of their plastics with hemp, and we had a composting program nationally, we could eliminate plastic use, single use plastic waste by a crap ton. I mean, think about that, really. If we made everything from hemp plastic and on top of that, hemp plants clean the air and they clean our soil, but they grow faster than trees. 
So if we had hemp farms all over the nation, all over the world, we would be able to clean our air, we would be able to clean our soil, and we would be able to provide stock and seeds and all of these things in our other, um, uh, you know, our hemp or, uh, environments for medicine and food and all of these things. This is probably the most viable plant ever known to man. Do you see this? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Because this is the miracle that we've always had. And we and we said all these lies about this plant for so many years when reality hits you and goes, no wonder we've been using this as a human race for over 10,000 years that are documented. So we don't know. It could be millions. Right. Um, and the other fun thing about hemp is that um, cannabis was the first known domesticated crop ever in human history ever before anything else. So um, just to, that's just a little bit of a history lesson and use on hemp, but that just blows me away. When I saw this picture a long time ago about hemp plastic, I thought to myself, we could easily change the world right there. Okay, let's see what else. All right, let's get into the actual information about cannabis. So cannabis is the species that both hemp and marijuana live under. Um, in reality, hemp is the slang term or um, easy term to uh, make you realize like that this, this is the industrial plant, right? It's not for recreational use. Um, it has very low THC. It has very high CBD usually. But hemp is grown mainly for industrial purposes, whereas marijuana, also a slang term mean, meaning Mary Jane um, in Spanish, but also marijuana was coined by our indigenous um, ancestors. So the indigenous people coined it as a mother plant. And um, and so marijuana is is not the true scientific term. The real term for both of these plants is cannabis. And cannabis sativa L is the lineage that hemp falls under. And then cannabis uh, marijuana will fall under cannabis sativa sativa, cannabis sativa ruderalis, cannabis sativa indica. Um, there's lots of different strains, um, but typically hemp will have uh, thinner leaves, um, so they'll, they'll be like more stocky, more thin. And then um, the uh, marijuana or indica dominant, which by the way, everything is a hybrid now. There's no true sativa and there's no true indica anymore because everything has been hybrided since like, you know, thousands of years ago with the original genetics of hemp and, and marijuana. But the stock um, is, is hardier on hemp and the fan leaves are, are skinnier. Whereas in marijuana, they're going to be a little bit wider. Um, but that doesn't necessarily indicate what you're getting, right? Because the flower is going to be dried and kind of curled up in itself. Um, but as you can see here on um, the picture to the right, hemp would be considered by the federal government, low levels of THC cannot get you high. And the federal government categorizes marijuana as a variety grown with higher levels of THC. Right now, they're documenting it federally as 0.3% THC. So to categorize it as hemp, it has to be below 0.3 in its dry weight and marijuana is anything above that. But in reality, hemp grows with higher levels of THC and marijuana grows with lower levels of THC. It's all about cultivation. And so it just depends on the genetics of the plant, the climate, the soil, the water quality, the sunlight, everything will change the genetics of these plants. And which is really cool because now we have thousands and thousands of strains. So if you've ever been to a dispensary and you have all these names, those are actually like breeding qualities. Um, some are patented by certain farms. And then the biggest thing is terpene content. Terpenes are what give you that heady feeling or that body high feeling. Um, CBD is more of a sativa hybrid. And so you're going to kind of get a blend of that calming alertness. And I know that sounds funny, but like, yes, you can be alert and calm at the same time. You can be focused and, and feel um, uh, relaxed at the same time. And so that's why people look to CBD because it gives them a very stable, balanced feeling. Whereas THC can be anywhere around, like you can feel so many different things with THC, but once you add in those terpenes, those terpenes like lavender linalool or uh, cinnamon, like beta carophyllene and, and uh, limonene, like citrus. And if you've ever smelled a plant, it smelled citrusy. That's usually a good indicator that it's heavier with those sativa terpenes. And those are the things that actually make us 
feel the, the way that we do. It's not THC and CBD, like THC isn't a feeling, it is a psychoactive compound that makes your body react a certain way. It makes your chemical response a certain way. But the actual feeling surrounding that is really the terpenes. And the terpenes are something that really people are focusing on now. In my company with Green Compass, we have um, our line of Boost products. These boosters are terpenes, terpenes and essential oils that help you feel certain ways. So we've got, you know, a metabolism booster, an immune booster, a sleep booster, a pain booster. And these are all indicative of different types of terpenes and different types of strains of products. And they don't have CBD or THC in them. They're just boosters. So they, they can enhance and elevate uh, your CBD experience. Um, so you can take your CBD and your booster together and have a different experience versus CBD alone. All right, let's go back to this. So um, hemp, as you can see, has a high CBD con concentration. It is not psychoactive, so you will never get high off of a hemp product. Um, it grows in four months minimum, um, sometimes longer. It depends on the strain and how it's being grown. Um, it can grow over 20 feet tall. Um, so if it's used for industrial purposes, it's going to be grown very tall and stocky. And then um, if it's being cultivated for CBD, you're going to see it more bushy. And I'll show you a picture of that. And it is legal in all 50 states. Whereas marijuana is typically low CBD concentration. If you go to a medical dispensary, you can get products that will have um, equal ratios of CBD and THC. But those are specially made for medical purposes. Obviously, the psychoactive effects of marijuana will be felt typically from most um, cannabis marijuana strains. It grows in six to nine months, so it's a little bit longer. It takes a lot more care and cultivation to grow it for medicine. And this is indicative also of our, of our company. We grow it as a bush. We grow it for the flower. And so the, the cultivation process is much longer than the stocky, tall hemp. So, so you always want to ask, how is your hemp or your CBD being cultivated? It is even being cultivated as, as if it was marijuana, if it is in a bushier plant, so that it has more flower, it has less stock, and so then you're getting more CBD from it versus an industrial hemp product. A lot of companies, I would say probably 80% of them out there, are growing it industrially. Um, they grow, they actually marijuana can grow incredibly tall. Like I've seen bushes that look taller than trees. Um, and as we know, it is legal in some states. Um, we have I don't know how many recreational states we have now, but over 45 um, states in America do have some sort of medical cannabis um, program. So like Texas isn't considered fully medical marijuana, but we do have a com compassionate use program and that's being expanded. So now people in Texas can get better medical ratios and you can use products like CBD and medical cannabis together. Um, it's very expensive to go to a practitioner, get your license, and then the dispensaries are in Austin. So um, you always want to think about like, what are you actually treating it for? And I'm happy to speak with you about, do you need medical cannabis? Do you need CBD? Do you need a variety of both? And how to go properly into that program, how to find the right doctor to refer you, how to do follow-ups, how to make sure your dosing is right, and all of those things. Okay, so what does CBD actually stand for? Um, CBD stands for cannabidiol or cannabidiol. You can say it either way. Um, and this is just one of the many compounds found in the cannabis plant. There's actually over a hundred cannabis um, or cannabinoids, as we would say. The primary ones that people know about are CBD, THC, CBG, CBN, CBC. And then there's a variety of minor non-active molecules. There's acidic compounds. Um, and we're still learning. We're still isolating all these compounds. So a lot new ones are coming out. A lot of people have been talking about Delta 8 THC and Delta 8, just like Delta 9 THC is psychoactive. You will get high. You will get very high actually um, because most of the products are in gummy form um, and edibles when they hit your liver can be up to eight times stronger than the dose that is indicated on the wrapper. So I've had a lot of friends go, oh, I heard about Delta 8 and I took it and I was high for 12 hours. Um, I had a friend that took it at night and was still high the next day. So you have to be really careful with the products that you're using and make sure you talk to someone like myself who knows a lot about the different compounds, how they're used and what kind of reactions you can have because it's very, very dangerous for you to go into using any of the THCs like the Delta THCs, whether it's nine or eight, if you've never used them before. So please, please be safe with your usage. Um, it's very, very important. 
Uh, Marilyn, yes, you can use this afterwards. Hi, Alyssa, thank you. Um, so CBD is non-psychoactive or non-psychotropic. It will not get you high. But cannabis um, or cannabinoids are not just in the cannabis plant. They're actually found in other plant sources like hops, um, black pepper, cacao, um, cocoa beans, um, as well as um, many other flowering plants. So if it has a flowering top, um, like like hops uh, and, and other products that are cruciferous greens are going to have traces of cannabinoids. And then a very fun, interesting fact is that we actually produce a form of cannabinoid in our breast milk, um, which is why it is so important that when you're first um, having a baby that you do um, pass that colostrum on because there is gonna be a heavy abundance of cannabinoids that our body produces. So we actually produce humans produce cannabinoids. So not necessarily CBD, CBG, THC, but we do produce our own chemicals. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that now. <clears throat> oh, that's right. We're going to talk about the actual plant. So here is the flowering top part of the cannabis plant on the left. Um, so you've got your flower, cola, calyx, trichomes, sugar leaves, fan leaves, pistils, node, and stem. And the flower is where the abundance of the cannabinoids are in the um, cola, calyx, and trichomes. And this is also the trichomes are going to give that flower that sparkly look. Um, and that is also where some isolated cannabinoids can be found as well. In the middle here, we have a little graphic of some of the major cannabinoids that are known um, and primarily studied. So right now we have a lot of minor cannabinoids um, like Delta-8 that's come up that hasn't been really thoroughly studied in a medical application yet, but these are the main ones, CBD, THC, THCA, CBG, CBN, CBC, THCV, and CBDA. These are the ones that have the most medical studies of. They are where, what we would call the, the mother molecules. This the and, and some of them are active and some of them are non-active, but they're um, the very, very important ones. And it's really great to find a product that has a variety of these. Um, CBD, THC, CBG, CBN, CBC are ones that you're going to find primarily in products. And if you're lucky, there will be maybe traces of THCA, THCV, and CBDA. Um, but unless it is a THC dominant uh, crop, like a marijuana plant, you're not going to see as many of the varieties of THC. Uh, in the picture behind it, you're going to see a, a farm. Um, and, and to the right is um, hemp stock. So industrial hemp, and then the bushes are being utilized for probably CBD or seeds. Um, and so that's primarily how our company grows it is in the bushy form, and those will get much bigger as they mature. And then on the right side, that hemp is going to grow very, very tall. Um, as I mentioned, the cannabis terpenes and their benefits, um, here's just a snapshot, and I can send you lots more of these, um, but you've got pinene, little lul, myrcene, limonene, osamine, um, tons of different terpenes that do have actual medical benefits. So pinene is really good for focus and memory. Linalool is um, what is found in lavender, so it relaxes you. It's really helpful with sedation, anxiety, and um, and sleeplessness. Uh, Myrcene is another really nice balancing sedative. Limonene is citrus, um, so it's found in orange and lemons and limes and grapefruit. And limonene is really great um, as, uh, as as so many things, um, but primarily for energy. Uh, and you can kind of Google all of these, but um, they all have different utilizations. And what's really cool is you can find different um, cannabis strains that are heavy in certain types of terpenes. And so if you're looking to feel a certain way, look for the terpenes that are predominant in that strain. So for instance, like I said, the boost products that my company uses, these are going to be so like the pain booster is going to be primarily the um, terpenes that help with pain. So beta carophyllene is an anti inflammatory. Um, and then we also include um, turmeric and black pepper and chaga, which are all really good for anti-inflammatories and pain. Our sleep booster is going to be heavy in linalool. Linalool is found in lavender, and we actually add lavender and chamomile to the booster to help with sedation, calming effects, and sleep. Um, our immune booster is going to be heavy in um, limonene, 
which is really great to help produce glutathione in the body. The glutathione is something that we start losing as we age and it's a protector. It helps us fight viruses. And that's why so many people, you know, when you look at what's happening in the country right now and people that are of older age are more susceptible, it's mainly because their body isn't producing glutathione and some of the chemicals later in life, right? You start losing elasticity. You start losing all of these things as you get older. So it's really important to supplement with products that can produce glutathione, that can produce immune protecting benefits. So if you haven't thought of that before, if you're not necessarily looking for CBD, look at one of our boosters. It can add to your experience. All right, let's see what's next. Okay, so how does all of this work? The endocannabinoid system was in, um, discovered in 1994 by a very famous doctor out of Israel. And he is known as kind of like the godfather of the endocannabinoid system. They were able to isolate THC and CBD and study them. And as they studied these isolated uh, molecules and how it reacted with the body, we realized that we had a receptor system that is probably the most important receptor system in our our bodies. The endocannabinoid system is the regulator, the great regulator. It even regulates the brain. So we always think of the brain as the boss, right? Well, the endocannabinoid system can actually help the functioning of the brain. The endocannabinoid system is found in the brain, in the central nervous system, in your peripheral organs, in your skin, your muscle tissue, your bones. It helps with immune growth. It helps with bone growth. It helps with your endocrine system, your sexual organs. Um, and balancing all of the chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, cortisol, oxytocin, and lots of other chemicals that our body produces as rewards, as stressors. And so all of it, it really comes down to balance. The endocannabinoid system is, is trying to do what's called homeostasis. And if you haven't heard that word, it's really, really important. But homeostasis is basically the point when the body is balanced. So you're getting the right levels of chemicals in your body. Your body is not reacting to stressors the way that it had before. But why is it so important for your brain to be accessed? So a lot of people say, well, I don't want to take anything that accesses my brain because I could get high. Well, first of all, CBD doesn't make you high. So we know that first. Um, but here's what it can do. It can help with cognitive processes, fear and anxiety, emotions, memory and learning. It is a neuroprotectant. So when we see um, neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's and Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, forms of epilepsy, this, this, these molecules actually help protect um, the, the neurons, the, the neuro pathways in our brain. It reduces seizure activity. It helps with mental illness and managing psychosis. It's, it's been known in studies that high amounts of CBD can actually help with mania and schizophrenia. And these are all documented medical sites that you can find if you um, send me a message. Um, it helps with pain and it's a super anti-inflammatory of all the things that CBD does and its inflammation support is so fantastic. Um, but what else does it do? It is the gatekeeper of the immune system. It helps with allergies. It helps with vasodilation and cardio protection. And while it doesn't access the, the heart directly, the heart muscle or the autonomic system that keeps our heart pumping by itself, it does help as cardio protection. It can reduce blood pressure and blood sugar. Uh, it helps with intestinal, uh, intestinal motility and inflammation. So we see a lot of these um, inflammatory bowel syndromes and diseases that have been really, really helped by CBD because of its access to the gastrointestinal system. Um, it helps with reduction of bone loss. So a lot of people are using it later in life to help heal injuries, to um, keep their bones strong, to help with um, bone pain and nerve pain. It regulates the growth of our skin. It helps rapidly um, increase the cellular turnover. Now let's look at the endocannabinoid system. We've got receptors, CB1, CB2, and then there are one, two, three, four, five other receptor systems that are linked to the endocannabinoid system. So we always say like CB1 and CB2, but now they're saying GPR55 could be thought of as a CB3 receptor, um, accessing the cerebellum and uh, the pineal gland. Um, as well as, you know, um, receptors found in our bone and, and actually in our brain. GPR-119 is in the pancreas and intestinal tract. So, I mean, can you imagine the the application of these products is phenomenal. Uh, and, and people always ask me, how can one thing do so many 
oper you know, how can it help so many things? Well, it really comes down to the cellular response. CBD cannabis accesses a cellular system, our endocannabinoid system. And every being that has a spine has an endocannabinoid system. So we see this in reptiles, we see this in winged animals, um, obviously cats and dogs, bunnies, goats, uh, your agriculture, anything. And it's not just mammals, it is in reptiles as well. Um, we don't find them in insects at all, they don't have a spine. Anything with the spine has a form of an endocannabinoid system and, and in theory can use CBD. Now, there's not a lot of other molecules studied on animals other than CBD. So just be careful when you're giving your um, pet products. They have a much more sensitive system than us. We have a much more developed and um, and complicated system and we are, we're hit with a lot more stimuli. So our body response is different. Whereas dogs don't have abilities for grammar and, and, and the cognition that we have. And so our body is just function a little bit different. So always make sure when you work with a pet that you start in very small doses and you kind of test their sensitivities because it's been known where my friend gave like a full spectrum to their dog and he slept all day. Not that that's a bad thing, but they are just much more sensitive than we are. Okay. So understanding the receptors, I'm not going to get into the science too, too much, but here is a receptor and you've got your presynaptic and postsynaptic, which is receiving the neuron connection. And that is the endocannabinoid uh, system receptor. And, um, and then you've got the cannabinoids. Um, that you take from plants. So our endocannabinoids are endogenous, right? Our internal cannabinoids, our body produces our own form. Um, like for instance, anandamide. A lot of people will take CBD and they'll text me and they'll say, I took my first dose and I feel like, woo, that is not feeling high. That is a chemical that your body produces called anandamide. And anandamide is also coined as the bliss molecule. It's the bliss molecule that's released during a runner's high or an exercise boost. Um, that feeling that you get afterwards uh, after sex. Um, women that are breastfeeding are also producing this. So that calming effect is actually our chemical in our own body being produced. So it's not CBD that's making you feel that way. It's our body producing that. And usually over a couple of days, that anandamide kicker will kind of settle down and you you won't feel it as much, but some people that are highly sensitive or have never taken cannabis products before will feel it a little bit more than others. That, that doesn't always happen. Most people don't necessarily feel CBD. Now you definitely will feel THC, Delta 9 or Delta 8. You will definitely feel those products. Um, but the receptors are part of our biological systems. And so when we take phytocannabinoids, which are plant based cannabinoids, they are able to help our body get back in balance or homeostasis and give us a chance to feel best mentally and physically. Um, and there are diseases now that people have been doing a lot of research on that are literally the lack of the endocannabinoid system signaling. So the body is just not able to function properly within the endocannabinoid system. And so that's what's making like all of these things happen, you know, migraines and inflammation response and pain and nerve issues and, and mental issues. And so like all of these things categorically like kind of compound on each other and they make you feel a lot of different things. Well, that could just be the endocannabinoid system being off kilter. And that could be your toxin, your diet, um, environmental issues, trauma that you've had, whether physically or mentally, anything that's ever happened in our lives is going to be stored somewhere. And um, anything we've been exposed to is not necessarily going to be detoxed unless you went through a detox process. And so our body is trying to functioning and balance that. And so if you do have a lot of toxin exposure, you can expect to be going through about three to six weeks initially of detoxing. And this is really important because you want those chemicals out of your body. Your body needs to be balanced and, and, and healthy. All right, let's see what we've got next. Oh, okay, let's go to here. Let me make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay. So the human CBD receptor chart, we went after this. This is a better um, picture of the endocannabinoid systems um, being uh, enhanced by the phytocannabinoids. And you can take a picture of this if you'd like. Um, and I've got all of these slides available if you need. Uh, let's talk about identifying a really good CBD oil because people always ask me, you know, there's a lot of different products on the market. And I'm going to give you some um some things to look for and reasons why. Number one, if you're gonna use any product at all, you need to make sure that it has a certificate of analysis. This is a lab report done by a third party. It needs to be a certified lab, usually ISO certified. It has, there's different 
categories that um, labs need to meet for them to be able to say that they are a certified third party lab. There's a lot of falsified lab reports out there. And so you want to actually look at the lab report and make sure that it links back to the lab that it was um, studied through uh, because people do make falsified lab reports. So um, if you have any questions about certificates of analysis, I do have a downloadable guide on how to read a certificate of analysis um, that you can get through my website. Uh, Andy Hempco. So um, we're going to be starting to send those booklets out soon to all of our followers. Um, but a certificate of analysis is going to not only tell you the CBD content, but also if let's say the product is not USDA certified organic, so it doesn't already meet those organic um, qualifications, it does need to also be additionally tested for pesticides, chemical solvents, um, any type of residual. So uh, when a hemp plant is in the ground, it pulls everything out of the soil and anything that's in the water will also be in the plant. So when you take CBD, it could possibly have um, processing issues. Like if it's not processed right, it could have salmonella, E. coli, you could have nuts somehow in there. So you always want to make sure the plant or the processing facility is nut free, gluten free, vegan, no, um, you know, access to anything else. And then on top of that, people, you know, pesticides, pesticides could be in the soil. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're using pesticides, but for seven years, sometimes it takes for, for the plant to clean out that soil. So if it was used for something else before, you need to make sure that it's tested. So pesticides, herbicides, chemical solvents, heavy metals, those are all of the things that can be in the soil. And let's say that the hemp is coming from China, which a lot of it comes from China. China produces tons and tons of hemp. They use it to clean their soil. They use it to clean their air. And then they process it and they send it to America. And then people make CBD out of that. Know where your hemp is coming from. You guys do not buy CBD on Amazon. CBD from Amazon is not real CBD. It's usually hemp seed and it can contain God knows what. I have had bottles sent away to be processed, to be tested, and we found bottles with E. coli, salmonella, mercury, and heavy, heavy, like toxic amounts of lead. That is indicative of it being utilized as a cleansing agent, and then that CBD was sold to whomever, and somebody slapped a label on it and sold it to you for 15 bucks. If you're finding a product that is very, very cheap, it is probably going to be because it is inexpensive, crap quality and it could be poisonous so be really careful about why where you buy your products who you buy your products from if they're sourcing on it make sure you know where the hemp is grown and that there's a certificate of analysis attached um and and like i said clean soil is really important our company is usda certified organic um green compasses and and i'm a presidential founder with green compass and i do train our field um on why why we do what we do and the usda certified organic means that we've already gone through all of the the testing we've already had our soil and our water and even the hemp crop has been tested so we don't have to do additional testing on the back end because we meet the strict standards of a um you know a, a a facility of processing, good manufacturing processes, certain certifications to say that, yes, our processing facilities are clean and meet the highest standards of the industry. But even before that, the hemp is grown in industrial, in, in, in USDA certified organic soil in a farm that has been grown organically for years. And so to meet those qualifications is very, very difficult. There are very few brands out there that are USDA certified organic soil. The farm is organic the hemp crop is organic and the brand is organic and this just tells you that your product is going to be clean on top of that you want to make sure that it's extracted clean so there's a lot of companies that will use butane and ethanol and like gasoline and we don't want to be you know making our products from that if you're taking a supplement every day you don't want traces amounts of chemicals and so co2 is not only environmentally friendly but it preserves the canna cannabinoids better than solvents um, some people will say that other solvents or distillation processes for terpenes need to be used and we do know that we we do have a different a separate processing for terpenes um, but for our CBD our cannabinoids um, carbon dioxide extraction is what we use and it is the cleanest way to extract um, and, and, and again environmentally friendly that is very very important to our company that we meet the highest grain standards another thing you want to look for is that your product is grown from the hemp flower um, 
the aerial parts, you know, if you see aerial parts on the back, sometimes you'll see 30 milligrams of active cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids, but a total of 60 cannabinoids. That's not really true because what they're doing is they're including the milligrams of aerial parts of the fiber, um, which actually have like very small amounts of active cannabinoids. And so you have to really know on the back of the bottle, if it says aerial parts, that means that that is not, it's not necessarily active CBD. Um, a lot of companies do this. And so it makes it seem like the product is much higher in cannabinoids than it is. And so this is why it's always important to know is the amount of CBD that's on the bottle active cannabinoids or inactive? Because if it says aerial parts, that means that it's partially inactive. And that will give a big difference to like, let's say you take a quarter dropper of our product and a quarter dropper of another product, there's gonna be a huge difference because theirs contains inactive cannabinoids and our con ours contains only active cannabinoids. Does that make sense? You guys are welcome to ask me questions afterwards. This is very detailed. Um, another thing that you want to look for is a clear or golden color. Um, and sometimes it'll be slightly green and that is the chlorophyll that is from the plant. So it depends on what the carrier oil is. So hemp seed will sometimes be like a, a gold uh, color. Sometimes it'll be slightly green because chlorophyll has been added back in. Um, but typically most products are going to be like a clear or golden color. Uh, this means that you want to be able to see through the liquid. Um, if it's got, if it's very opaque, that's a bad sign. Um, as well as if it's opaque, it means that it might have plant matter in it. And while I highly suggest juicing cannabis and eating cannabis and using all of it, when you're looking for active cannabinoids, primarily, you want a clear golden color. Um, and there's a lot of products out there that will be like more heavily green, more thick. And, and that could just be, you know, plant matter, acidic compounds. Um, there's so many reasons for that, but most people are buying CBD to work for specific things. And so our, we want to make sure that our product is made with the best quality active cannabinoids. And that's what we're looking for. The plant acids will give it sometimes a very weedy flavor um, and taste and smell. And our, you know, we've, we've done kind of, kind of some surveys on the field. And while I love a weedy smell, I love a real nice, pure product. Um, uh, I also agree that most of my clients don't want their product to smell like like weedy they don't want it to be very earthy they want it to have a pleasant taste and smell um, and this also encourages people to use it every single day um, because they do like the taste uh, the last thing is um, the carrier oil so there's a lot of different carriers carrier oils out there why is it important to have coconut oil? So coconut oil or MCT oil is very high in saturated fat and this is a good thing because you need less drops to carry it through to your bloodstream. Um, MCT oil also breaks the blood brain barrier. And the blood brain barrier is really important because we want those CBD, those active cannabinoids to get to your brain so that you can help things with like memory, focus, anxiousness, calming your, you know, those different chemical balancing um, agents. And so MCT oil being high, the highest in saturated fat um, will help carry that. Will that ha hurt your liver? I mean, if you're drinking like two bottles a day, <laughs> then it could hurt your liver, but these small amounts are not going to be um, any, any long-term effect on your liver, um, especially your CBD amounts. You would have to take ungodly amounts, which really aren't even, I mean, I don't, I don't see anybody who could afford to spend like a thousand dollars a day on CBD to shove that much in their system. So there's really no indication of, of liver issues. Um, like some of these, um, these studies have shown that they've given ungodly amounts to mice. Now there are other carrier oils like hemp seed oil, which is very, very good. It's just not as high in saturated fat. And so it's not good for a sublingual tincture. And that's like under the, under the tongue. Um, and hemp seed is really good for animals. So we like to put hemp seed in their body for their hair, skin and nails because they can't hold it under their tongue. And MCT oil is really good for under the tongue use. Now there's pecan oil, sunflower oil, avocado oil. These are all much lower in saturated fat. So they're not gonna have as high of an absorption rate MCT oil has the highest of the absorption rates, um, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the other types of ways that you can take it. So let's start with sublingual. 
I'm going to try to wrap this up within an hour. <laughs> Sublingual delivery means under the tongue. This is the best and most accurate way to take CBD or any cannabis products. Any clinician, all of the studies that I've gone through, all of the classes that I've gone through have all said that the tincture is the best way to dose. Why is that? Because you can actually get it down to a drop, right? You can you can make sure that it is to a half of a milligram or a milligram. And when you take edibles, it's harder to know when you're digesting and how much is getting to the bloodstream. Um, smoking, your inhalation levels can be different every time. And so that's really hard to indicate. There are some companies that do inhalers and sprays and things like that. But again, some people are so sensitive that they need just a couple drops. And so tinctures are the best way to really, really nail down your dose. But let's say that, and, and the other thing is when you put it under your tongue, it goes into the bloodstream directly. So you're bypassing uh, the stomach and the gastrointestinal system and the liver. And this is really good also if you're on medication so that it reduces the interaction. Um, topical delivery is great because you can apply it right where it hurts, right? Or right where you have a skin issue and CBD and other cannabinoids are so fantastic for pain and skin issues and nerve issues. Um, and because we have skin receptors that is, um, delivered throughout the muscles, the bones and the nerves. So a lot of people ask me, why would I take a, um, a topical because it doesn't go all the way down to the bone. Well, it's because it hits the receptors on the skin and then it's delivered throughout the endocannabinoid system. So it's it's about the cellular response more than it is the skin. Um, but of course, some creams will have peppermint and wintergreen and different essential oils like menthol and camphor that'll give that icy hot feeling that helps with pain and inflammation. But then the product getting into the receptors is really where the magic happens. Um, and that's why it's important to know the levels of active ingredients in your topicals. Um, for instance, with our pain line, we are FDA registered and we have to be able to show stability and consistency of our products to make sure that those active ingredients are always the same that we say on the bottle. Active ingredients follow the over-the-counter FDA regulations. And so when you see an over-the-counter product like Icy Hot, it has to show that it will always have the same amount of menthol and camphor, methyl salicate, lidocaine, things like that, because those are active ingredients. And having too much can be bad, right? So we have to tell that we have to register our products and go through a testing process to make sure our products are exactly what they say they're doing. Okay, so topicals are great. If you have pain, you should be taking internally and externally. Anybody that has pain should always do both because over time, your body's going to start, get, you know, fixing things and reducing inflammation. The pain's going to go down, but topically, you're going to hit the receptors from both ways. Okay, this is a new thing that a lot of people have been talking about, and everyone is freaking out about our nano jellies. Um, but nano emulsification is so important for edibles. Anytime you're taking something, you're not holding it under the tongue. When it goes into the stomach, part of it burns up in the stomach acid. And then it has to go through the gastrointestinal system. And then it has to be processed by the liver. Now, when you take a drink or an edible, it breaks down as it goes through your system. And then when it, hit, when it hits your liver, another enzyme called the CYP450 enzyme can also change the chemical uh, reactions of the, of the molecule. So using water soluble is so fantastic with an edible. And so um, Green Compass, when they first started um, thinking about doing a gummy or an edible, they wanted to make sure that it was going to, you know, completely absorb in the system, at least in the 90, 90th percentile. And because when you're putting it under your tongue, the sublingual delivery goes right into the bloodstream through the oral mucosal veins. But when you're eating it, it's getting burned up in the stomach through the gastrointestinal system. Once it hits the liver, like you could be taking a 25 milligram gummy and really only absorbing one milligram. So less is more with nano amplification and nano amplification really means like, let's say the molecule is this big, we are able to shrink it down so that blood cell, the cell can actually absorb the molecule fully instead of like a Pac-Man taking a little piece of it. So nano amplification is really fantastic because when it hits the stomach on an empty stomach, right as soon as it hits the small intestines, it goes into the bloodstream and is fully absorbed. And this is so key with edibles. So if you're ever gonna look for a gummy, look for nano emulsified, nano amplification, water soluble. Um, that is just really, really important for an edible. So that'd be a drink or a food item. Okay. 
Let's move on to dosing. So a lot of people ask me about dosing and this is going to be different for every single person. Um, and you really don't know based on a symptom or um, really anything of how a company, a, a, a person is going to react and also how that person, how that company, that CBD oil is going to react, right? Because every CBD brand is different. So Dr. Dustin Sulak, who is um, a doctor that I studied under and I've done you know, hundreds of hours of training through his um, systems, the healer certification, also society of cannabis clinicians. He is a leading facilitator and he has really got this down to a science. So a lot of people do best with microdosing where you literally start with one to two drops under the tongue and every few days you increase um, and you and you journal it, you write it down. How is it easy it, is it to breathe? How comfortable and calm does your body feel? Can you smile authentically? And then write down your scores and see how your body's reacting because it doesn't have to just be, I have pain relief, right? So, so many people will call me and say, I'm looking for some pain product. Um, at, you know, I have really bad pain. Uh, but they might also need they're sleep regulated, they're calming regulated, like there's so many other things in the body that are really important, immune functions. So if someone's having pain, there's probably a lot of other things going on too. So when you microdose, your sweet spot is going to be different for your body, your genetics, your endocannabinoid system receptors. It's not about weight. It's not about how you tolerate pain pills either. That's a different system, you guys. Aleve, acetaminophen, uh, opiates, that's a different receptor system. The endocannabinoid system is, it functions differently. And so unless you've used cannabis or you've had a diet heavy in cannabinoids, your body wouldn't necessarily know what to do with it or how it would respond. So microdosing is always the best bet. It just takes time. So you can expect three to six weeks to see any changes. And I know you might be like, I don't have time to wait for that. But this is about healing. This is about changing and, and getting better and not having to rely on things that poison us, medications that are hurting our bodies every day. And so you have to take time and patience. This is a patient plant to really get it right. Now, if you overdo it, you could do the opposite. You could get the opposite effect. You could feel more pain. You could feel more anxious. You could feel um, you could stay up all night. A lot of people, I'll, I'll tell them, okay, start on a small dose and work your way up. They decide to go home and take a whole dropper full and then they stayed up all night. They're like, your product didn't work and I was awake. Do not overuse the product just because you feel like you should. You need to either work with a cannabis clinician, somebody who knows about dosing, how and why it reacts in the body a certain way. Maybe they have a protocol for pain or inflammation management or nerve management. But the best bet always is to start low and slow. And our company will say that to you in all of our videos, start low and slow and document it. Just because it says one dropper full on the bottle, that's a serving size that we have to give based on the USDA, right? We have to put a label on there that says a suggesting serving size. And for some people, one dropper full is what they need, but that doesn't mean you start there. Make sure you start at a low, low dose. Um, average dose is usually a quarter of a dropper. Okay, let's go back. Medication interactions. This is a question that we get a lot because so many of you guys are on medications and we have to be really careful. If you have a warning symbol on your medication about grapefruit, you should take caution. This is in your liver, the CYP450 inhibitor or inducer. You have to be cautious when working with CBD because it can enhance or inhibit the abilities of the medication. That's why we always say, put it under your tongue and hold it there for two minutes to bypass the liver. Take a nano gummy to bypass the liver. That way there's not a contradiction in the liver, but the liver is where all of the things can happen. So when you're taking CBD, especially like blood thinners, a medicine like blood thinners that, that could keep you alive, please make sure that you check with your doctors first before starting any supplement. This goes for anything. Anything that could that could enhance or inhibit your medication, you need to put it through your doctor. Or if you don't have a pharmacist that is educated in CBD, please reach out to me. I do have a couple pharmacists on hand that are educated in cannabis and we can look at those interactions to make sure that they're that they're okay. But always, always make sure that your doctor knows what you're doing. Um, and if your doctor isn't educated, that's okay. Give them a chance to learn. Offer them um, a book that is about cannabis so that they can be a better practitioner. There are medical cannabis books out there. It is being trained now in medical school, 
So um, when people say there's no research, like they're teaching it now that there are courses for medical practitioners to be cannabis providers. Um, the education is there. There's tons of books and training courses and everything that your medical um, provider can look into. And I would really encourage you to say, like, if you don't know enough and you're saying to me that there's not enough research, that's not true. But I really encourage you to do the research yourself because this is not going to go away, you guys. You have to tell your doctors this is something that you need to learn because more people are going to start using CBD. More people are going to be using cannabis as the legality changes. You have to make sure that you're on par with it um, because you can't just tell someone not to use a product that, that could change their lives. Right. So people are going to look to CBD because of its abilities. Um, so make sure your doctors know that. Okay, so people always ask, can it help me? Uh, we have to be really careful because the FDA has our hands tied. You cannot use diagnostic terms. So we can't say it's going to help or cure or treat or prevent your anxiety or your chronic pain or your fibromyalgia. We can't use those terms. But we can talk about some of the symptoms like general pain and discomfort, uh, in immune support, uh, feelings of anxiousness, right? Um, not, not have, you know, if you are, diagnosed with anxiety anxiety dis disorder excuse me anxiety disorder make sure that you talk to your therapist or your psychiatrist first right um and and it is safe um generally safe the the world health organization and the cdc have both said that cbd is generally safe for everyone as long as it is used properly um but you can also get clinical studies based on the disease or function that you're trying to help so make sure that you do your research the national institute of health any nih.gov tons of research there are books and books and books of medical studies there are encyclopedias out there there are so many places for you to go and find source information to hear about how it's used in a clinical setting for treatment how it's been used in blind placebo studies double blind placebos it's been used by the fda and 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 really a lot of studies you can find under the drug Epidiolex, which is an FDA approved CBD predominant drug. And that can give you a good idea of contradictions as well. All right, let's see if there's anything else. Does anyone have any questions? I think this is the end of my presentation. <laughs> So just to clarify, um, my name is Marlise. I'm a certified medical cannabis advisor. I have several other certifications. I've been working as a healer for many years now. I've helped thousands and thousands of people. I've trained tens of thousands of people. And I do own a company called Indie Hemp Company. Indie Hemp Company is separate from the brand that I represent. Indie Hemp Company is my educational and medical consulting firm that I use to partner with practitioners to help people get the cannabis education that they need and the proper guidance because many practitioners just don't have the time or the energy to work with CBD. And so it's really, really important that people come to somebody who does know what they're talking about. That is separate from Green Compass. So I just want to clarify that, that this training is overall a, utilizing the brand that I work with that I know so well, but these are primary things that you should know. Okay. Can you explain bypassing the liver with the oil? Let's see. That. Oops. This training is okay. So, um, Kimberly, when you take a sublingual product, you want to hold it under your tongue as long as possible. Um, if you hold it under your tongue, it typically will absorb through the oral mucosal veins, right? And it will not go like once it hits the liver, if it does hit the liver, it'll, it'll be in very, very, very small amounts. Um, because if people are on medications that say that there's a contra contradiction with grapefruit, you have to be really, really careful with that. So again, always talk to your doctor, but the faster absorption, the better that you will not see contradictions on the back end. Um, but also you, you know, think about people that are, are on certain mental stability medications. It's really important to know what their medical diagnostic is um, and work with their psychiatrist or their psychologist because when you introduce CBD, it can enhance or decrease the effects of their medicine or replace their medicine in some cases. And so we have to make sure that we're doing it properly and safely. So always, always get the doctor involved. This is a really good learning lesson for you as well. Um, and, uh, and then if you use a um, like a nano jelly, Something that's nano amplified, it's not going to be processed by the liver because it's going right into the bloodstream. And so that absorption level is really, really important. 
Uh, Alyssa, you can just screenshot your phone. Um, it's a really, really large file for me to email out to people. So if you would just turn your phone sideways and then when I had the screen, just screenshot that and you can utilize it. Um, this is a, a proprietary slide uh, slideshow for Indie Hemp Company. So this is not a green compass um, presentation. Um, this is kind of a whole view of CBD, the history, the applications and things like that. Um, are there any other questions? I'll give you a second. Let's see if there's anything coming through on my phone. Man, we went a long time with this presentation. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close it out. Thank you so much for watching this. Um, if you have any questions about CBD or cannabis, please let me know. Um, I do this as my full time job. I am um, very well educated and I'm always learning. I am not an expert in the field at all. Um, I there there is a lot more to learn every single day. So always be learning. Always be a student. There's so much more to learn every single day in your life. I encourage you to read. I encourage you to research. I encourage you to work with people that are um, well educated and and learn from them and absorb this and just keep watching presentations like this and keep absorbing this information. And if you're out there and you've thought about CBD and you haven't started, let's talk. Let's talk about why you haven't done or, or taken the plunge. And maybe it's because you're not trusting of a product. Maybe it's because you're not sure about the medications you're using. Maybe it's because you've been told the wrong information like we all have for so many years. Um, and so now's the time to start. Now's the time to go back to the original plant, the OG medicine that we've been used more than any medicine in human history. The ones that have been buried with mummies because this was such an important herb and it's such an important medicine to people that were buried. They put pounds and pounds of cannabis in their, sarcoph their sarcophagus. Like that just should tell you right there that this was something that people glorified because it changed lives. And even the, and I'll give you a little fun fact. A lot of people ask me about the Bible and how Jesus or God would feel about cannabis. And here's a, something interesting to know. CBD doesn't get you high. So therefore, it is not an intoxicating product. So there, there, that's one thing. Number two, if you look at the original Greek translation of the Bible before it was translated in the King James Version, the original text says that the holy anointing oil given to Moses in Exodus 30, 23, so chapter 30, verse 23, says flowering tops of conobosm. And conobosm was the only plant of that time. And I've clarified this with several translators. Conobosm was the only flowering top that could have been cannabis. Now it was changed to calamus, which also is a really good plant, but cannabis was the uh, primary in ingredient for the holy anointing oil given to Moses. Um, if you have any questions, I do have the original text that is written in Greek. Know your sources. And I know that the church has probably told you a lot of bad things about cannabis, but please, please understand the truth. I am a Christian. I am a Jesus follower. And I truly, truly believe that cannabis was given to us by God as a healing medicine. Um, and so I encourage you to look through that and try not to think about all of the other crap that we've learned about cannabis and marijuana. Look to the truth. Look through the sources. Look to the to the actual text that tells us how this product has been used, how this plant has been cultivated and worshipped by humans for 10,000 years. It's it's just so beautiful. And I hope that you learn to love it as much as I do. So again, my name is Marlies, owner of the Indie Hemp Company, uh, presidential founder with Green Compass Global. And I'm happy to educate you every day. That's why I'm here. And you guys have an amazing day.